Hello and welcome to Dialogue. China's northwest region of Xinjiang has been in the spotlight for years. Anti-terrorism and de-radicalization efforts have resulted in a more peaceful environment for all groups living there. Not only by policing extremism, but more importantly by addressing the roots of extremism found in poverty and lack of education. But some Western countries' allegations, including that of forced labor, are trying to reshape a different narrative. So what is the essence of issues in Xinjiang? And what political motivations and maneuvers lurk behind the allegations? To talk these issues, I'm joined by Victor Gao Zhikai, Chair Professor of Suzhou University, and R. Tangen, an independent current affairs commentator, Helga Zeb Lahouche, founder and president of the Sheila Institute, and Sultan M. Hali, managing director of Sony Dati TV in Pakistan. That's our topic. I'm Zhou Yuan. So let's start uh, with the topic from the French uh, journalist Maxime Vivas. Uh, he recently published a book about his two trips to the region. He said, uh, "Countless lies are being spread by people who have never been to Xinjiang." Uh, so let me start with you, uh, Victor. H how does Western perspective fit into others about Xinjiang? In what Vivas seem to view as political disinformation, I know you've been to Xinjiang several times before. Yes, I've been to Xinjiang many times. My first visit to Xinjiang was as early as in 1985, and uh, over the past several decades, I've been back again and again to do some business, to visit friends, etc. And in Beijing, I also have many friends who came from Xinjiang. Quite a few of them were our Uyghur brothers and sisters. I think, first of all, Xinjiang has transformed itself. It is now in peace,、mm -hmm. and people enjoy doing whatever they can to lift themselves out of relative poverty and abject poverty. The whole region is on the rise, and I think peace, people enjoy peace and stability. That's the mega trend. Now, the second point, allow me to emphasize, is that Xinjiang borders with Afghanistan, and the spillover. Of extremism and radicalization out of the 20-year war in Afghanistan, led by the United States, participated by NATO members, has a big spillover into Xinjiang, resulting in terrorism, extremism, and separatism. These evil forces need to be dealt with, and I think this is the harsh reality in Xinjiang. Now, many Western people, including Americans or some Europeans, they do not know the history or the realities on the ground. And the challenges and the opportunities in Xinjiang, and sometimes they are driven by political agenda. And I think the slandering and the false accusation against China about its policies and uh, uh, realities in Xinjiang are completely uh, detached uh, from the realities on the ground. So I think the Chinese people do have a reason to be <coughs> indignant about such false accusations, and they support the Chinese government in retaliation back. To these false sanctions levied by some of the Western countries against the Chinese government.、Mm. Uh, about the information on Xinjiang, we've gathered、uh, some social media accounts of voices on this issue. Let's take a look at some of them.、Uh, Silver Ashkak says, "You don't believe what Chinese say. You don't believe what people from Xinjiang and people who have been to Xinjiang say." So you depend on the media, which is malicious to China, to tell you the truth. I'd rather you believe no one and come to Xinjiang by yourself.、Uh, Helga,、uh, it is true that some of the accounts in Xinjiang are, are based on,、uh, I should say,、uh, biased information, false information. So, what do you think of the point、uh, that people should first probably visit Xinjiang to have a better idea of the place, Helga? Uh, <clears throat> yes,、uh, actually, several members of my Schiller Institute、uh, think tank have been going to Xinjiang, and、uh, they spend their a week each traveling, you know, to all kinds of、uh, institutions. And they all came back、uh, basically saying that all the, what they experience is that, you know, people are happy, they are content, that、uh, an extremely poor. Area of China, which was backward many years ago, is now experiencing prosperity, 
So I can only support that. I also talk to many diplomats who have traveled to Xinjiang and they all report the same thing. So I think that probably the best thing is that people really plan their next uh, summer vacation after the pandemic is over to Xinjiang and start to really get a first-hand impression. I think that that's the best medicine. And Sultan, uh, what is your understanding of the root causes of either security threats or poverty in Xinjiang? I know that Xinjiang is bordering Afghanistan uh, and Central Asia. Some of the problems probably get lost in uh, the communication in the West. Yeah, and they, indeed they do. Uh, but first of all, I would like to uh, re remind you our, and through you, our viewers, that my first visit to Xinjiang was in the year 1974 when I was a young uh, second lieutenant in the Pakistan Air Force. Mm -hmm. And since then, I have been visiting several times. And later on my retirement from the Pakistan Air Force, I became a writer. And I've been visiting Xinjiang so many times. It is now nearly, I mean, I'm going to cross a century. <laughs> and, and I have, and, and I've also So you've been seeing the changes on, happening on the ground. I, I'm an eyewitness to it. I'm an absolute eyewitness to it. And as an outsider, I don't mind sharing my view. Yes, Xinjiang has had problems. The Uyghurs, uh, they have been unhappy. But coming back to your question, what are the causes the root causes of this. There are quite a few. Uh, uh, one of them was uh, mentioned by your first speaker, uh, that it, there, there has been a spillover from the war in Afghanistan. Then also, you see, with the, uh, the fall of uh, the U USSR, many of the Central Asian republics, they became independent. And that same uh, feeling was transferred to the Uyghurs that they should strive for a separate homeland. Mm. But you see, the Chinese government, unlike many other governments of the world, decided to take the bull by its horns. And I am a witness to it. It tackled the problem very, very boldly with a true pronged uh, approach. This strategy was, first of all, that the separatists, the extremists, and uh, the terrorists, they must be dealt with with an iron hand. Number two, the causes of the deprivation, the causes of the feeling that uh, the people of Uyghur were neglected must be removed. And uh, I must say that, you see, congratulations and felicitations are in order that the Chinese government has not only removed absolute poverty from the entire China, but also from the uh, Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region, mm -hmm. which is a remarkable uh, change. And this is something which I've seen with my own eyes. And I don't mind sharing with, our, with your viewers that uh, the people of Xinjiang today are happy and they are satisfied. What you are listening is propaganda, it is fake news, and also uh, some of the causes, I mean, uh, maybe you'll come to later about a certain video and all, but uh, two weeks back, I was watching this program, GPS on CNN, which is hosted by Farid Zakaria. And he said that the United States, uh, especially the Pentagon, is using China as a excuse for seeking greater budgets for its defense spending. So that is why they are trying to create a bogey and a threat from China. But, but what do you think the China's response? Obviously, China has been pushing back against the EU, US, and Canada's sanctions over Xinjiang. Will this escalate? Well, you see, uh, if, if there was a misunderstanding, and if the misunderstanding is being removed, then it should come to an end. But unfortunately, there is no misunderstanding here. This is a deliberate move to push China against the wall. And the action that China has taken, first, initially, it was very patient. It was only trying to come out with logic, with evidence. I mean, there were stories of genocide and whatnot, but China produced statistics which showed that actually the population in uh, Xinjiang has risen many fold, much higher than what the uh, Han Dynasty is. But now that China has decided to come, come out hard, especially against some of the perpetrators of the falsehood like uh, Adrian Zenz, like some of the European Union countries, which are using double standards, the same Muslims that they are trying to suppress in their own countries, now they are trying to side with the Muslims uh, of the Uyghur uh, community. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a, a very strange phenomenon. So coming back to your question, I think it will escalate.
but china needs to stand firm it needs to present its uh, point of view uh, very very cogently and with hard mm. logic nr uh, how firmly do you think china should stand and what will be the consequences uh, because the larger co uh, context is probably china is facing uh, is historically a tense face off with the West. Well, China's only uh, angle in this is to continue to be successful. Uh, that's why they've been pushing the economic development. But make no mistake, this, China is deliberately trying to sinicize um, uh, all areas of China, not just uh, in Xinjiang, but also in, in Hong Kong, uh, Tibet. And by that, I mean they're not trying to suppress local culture. What they're doing is what they've done in every other part of China. You know, people don't realize that there were uh, recorded over 5,000 different dialects which are undecipherable to each other uh, in China, and that people had to be uh, educated uh, to speak standard Chinese, Pudonghua. And without that, China's ability to go forward would have been uh, very, very difficult as a nation. Uh, it is also very important to the economic development. If you have pockets of people who do not speak a language where they can get jobs, opportunities, and education, you are in essence dooming them to an apartheid existence. So at this time, China has uh, acted in part because of the kind of uh, nonsensical pressure that is being put on by this very coordinated uh, you know, disinformation campaign, which seems tr to trace its way back uh, <laughs> as through Adrian Zenz and the number of people associated and groups associated with the CIA. It's not surprising. What is surprising is that the international press is buying into it hook, line, and sinker, despite uh, very, very good uh, uh, journalistic pieces by a periodical called The Gray Zone, where they have been Ajit Singh, who has been exposing that uh, this has all been a web of lies. Mm. There are changes going on in Xinjiang. People are being educated. Uh, they are receiving jobs. The government is providing incentives to companies to locate in Xinjiang so that the people who've been trained can start working. But that is exactly what China has done in every single other area of the country, in part to address this kind of very, very deep um, poverty, which they wanted to get rid of. And other, uh, the other part is simply to advance the nation on an equal footing as much as yeah. possible. Uh, but the problem is how to communicate this better. Uh, Victor, uh, I know that you have been receiving uh, interviews from the Western media, including BBC, but they frame this question as forced labor, uh, re-education uh, re camps. Uh, but China sees this as a story to fight against uh, poverty and extremism and terrorism. H how can we have the ears of them if this is a different understanding of what is going on in Xinjiang. No, I don't think it's just a different understanding. I think some of the Western medias are driven by uh, uh, desires to serve either as an accomplice or as an instrument of the false accusation by the Western countries against China. And uh, uh, they, I don't think they are not educated. Uh, for example, you mentioned BBC. BBC headquarters is not far away from Oxford University or Cambridge University. If they care, they can basically see the best brains in the world to learn about the history of the Uyghurs, the history of Xinjiang, for example, and the history of the 56 nationalities living together to form the Chinese fabric in China. This is not difficult to understand. I think they are driven by other motivations. So you're and saying they're deliberately distorting the facts on the ground to serve an agenda? Absolutely. That's my suspicion. And I think this leaves China or people like us with no other option but to rise up to the occasion to explain the realities to them. For example, when you talk about genocide in Xinjiang, come on, the Uyghur population has increased from 5 million to about 30 million since 1950. And mm -hmm. as the Pakistani panelists just now mentioned, the Uyghur population growth rate has been higher than many other nationalities in Xinjiang, and much higher than the national average in China as a whole. So where is the genocide? But if you talk about genocide, we know which countries practice genocide, the extermination of the American Indians. That's genocide, the slavery 
of the uh, Amer uh, American Africans, for example, that's crime against humanity. And so if you really are serious about genocide or crimes against humanity, let's talk about the real cases of genocide and crime against humanity. You cannot falsify a situation and mm. try to impose that on top of the Chinese nation, claiming that the Chinese people are mm. a nation of rapists, for example. This creates a lot of indignation in China because they are really using so, sorry, so-called the media as an instrument to achieve their ulterior motive of false accusation and condemnation of China. And I don't think any Chinese will tolerate that. All right, let's look at the social media landscape again. Uh, take a look at what some of them have been saying, uh, what has happened in Xinjiang and the Western portrayal. Chris Thorne said BBC's Adrian Zentz lies on Xinjiang are being used by Biden to demonize China. But truth is, Uyghur population grown 200% in 40 years, lifespan increased from 35 to 72 years, 70% of Xinjiang's cotton farming were mechanized. No forced labor or forced abortion. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the big picture here. Helga. Probably not many people in the West understand that the Uyghurs people in Xinjiang have become better off economically uh, and socially. Uh, and that is important, right? <clears throat> yes. Um, I mean, what, you have to look at the history. Uh, <clears throat> when in 75, uh, Brzezinski decided to use the Islamic card against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, they started to train the Mujahideen they provided them with uh, advanced weapons, lots of money. And, you know, basically when then the Afghanistan war was lost by the Soviet Union, you know, the, <clears throat> uh, these networks, the Mujahideen, they spread to all countries in the region, to Pakistan, to Xinjiang, but also to some of the Soviet republics or former Soviet republics. And that is the problem. So, you know, when the Chinese started to transform these former terrorist networks into people who have a vision for the future, who have some perspective to have a job, a family. I mean, this is a, an incredible civil, civil achievement. I mean, in, in the same way, you know, I keep saying that people who talk about human rights violations in China, the fact that China has uh, lifted 850 million people out of poverty is the biggest humanitarian achievement and the biggest uh, human rights accomplishment of any country on the planet. I was the first time in China in 71, in the middle of the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. And I have been in China many times after that. And I am a witness not to Xinjiang, but I have seen the tremendous transformation China has undergone. And I think there you have the root of all of these attacks, because it's really the rise of China, which some of the geopolitical forces uh, in the West uh, are not willing to accept. So there is a whole different story. So people should not believe the stories being peddled by the media because they are just, they are as much a lie like the so-called weapons of mass destruction in Iraq in 2003. And that was the pretext for the war against uh, Saddam Hussein. <clears throat> and look what came out of it. You know, many people died. Uh, many people were becoming refugees. So you know, there is a real big story behind this whole story, and people have to get smarter and, and look through that. And about the roots of the terrorism, you mentioned the Mujahideen elements infiltrating Xinjiang, and then there are 2009 uh, terrorist attacks in Urumuchi. Uh, the people here probably are bothered. If this happened in Paris, London, or New York, people would react differently. But people in the West probably don't feel or the threat of terror in, in Xinjiang as they do in the West? Well, one problem is that people in general have very little knowledge about China. I mean, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, the, the tremendous economic miracle which China has accomplished, you know, people know that, you know, and they do business. The people who have been in China or who have uh, who are doing business with China, they, they normally have a different view. As a matter of fact, I just issued an international call to China experts from all over the world, 
people who have been in China have traveled there or have some kind of a you know, deep knowledge that they should all speak out and counter this campaign because you know if this is not corrected if this poisoning of the minds of people in the West by these media and by some politicians is not corrected it's very dangerous because you create an enemy image yeah. which you know if, if this is not stopped leads to war and therefore I have called these experts from all over the world to join in this campaign to to speak out and say this is a lie this is not true yeah uh, be, because it's a, a deep injustice and I really feel that and Sultan probably that hostility has already been manufactured uh, because according to a speech by Lawrence Wilkerson he's chief of staff to former US Secretary of State Colin Powell he said that the CIA would want to destabilize China, the best way to do it would be call social unrest in Xinjiang. So uh, this seems to be a strategy already unfolded. Uh, if that is the case, how can China defeat such a strategy and scheme? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, you see, because uh, sitting in Pakistan, uh, we have faced this firsthand. Uh, Helga just mentioned the war in Afghanistan. That was, uh, you see, the USSR or the Soviet Union at that time, which had at, uh, invaded Afghanistan. But it was the CIA that stood up. And even at that time, there were the stories of how this is to be turned to the advantage of the CIA or of the USA. And Pakistan became a frontline state because all the so-called Mujahideen, the Muslims from all parts of the world, including Xinjiang, they ended up in Pakistan. They were imparted guerrilla training. They were armed with the most deadly of weapons and they were given literature on jihad. And I participated in this particular operation. I was a serving officer in the Pakistan Air Force. We used to bring in, uh, you see, uh, uh, all kinds of weapons from all over the world. And at that time, the same situation was there and a conspiracy th theory was presented ultimately the USSR had to withdraw, but the CIA, instead of disarming the uh, Mujahideen, the people who had now become virtual Frankenstein, were let loose, still armed with the weapons, still having a lot of funds on them, and the spirit of jihad. Some of them returned to Xinjiang, and they turned on their own country. How China dealt with it, what is uh, we have already talked about it but coming to your main question of this particular uh, you see so-called smoking gun which has now been revealed which shows what is the real intention and how these Uyghurs are to be used but uh, please remember that uh, the colonel has mentioned uh, three reasons for the US troops to stay in Afghanistan yeah. one of them is to neutralize Pakistan's uh, nuclear weapons but uh, the main uh, thing he says is that the Uyghurs have to be exploited to destabilize China from within. Now, what China can do is that China can expose to the world these malicious intentions which have been used time and again to bring down or at least attempt to bring down a rising economy, which means no harm to the world, which is reaching out to the world with, uh, uh, you see, peaceful program, programs like the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a win-win situation for all. But unfortunately, yeah. it is being misconstrued as, uh, as something which is hegemonistic, which is absolutely based on falsehood. Uh, NR, realistically, the West still have to work with, the, with China on many issues. How far do you think uh, U.S. and its allies were pushed against China on the Xinjiang. And is there any chances of toning things down? No, uh, not really. Uh, at, at this point, the, the die has pretty much been cast. The U.S., as Helga said, is uh, at odds with China over geopolitical issues. But there's a, a been a very large shift. Economic gravity continues to flow eastward. Uh, the West is failing in its ability to control its markets and also uh, form governments and have leaders that are capable of handling the problems that they do have. Uh, this it creates a crisis moment, and the desire is to blame somebody else. China is now fitting in that role. In terms of how China could fight back, it, you can't. People aren't listening. Uh, the only way you can do it is by facts, and by that I mean mm. uh, continued prosperity within China. The best revenge is to live well. 
And if China is able to do that over time, all the, all the false rhetorics will fall away and people will see China for what it is, what it has done. Uh, there, are, there are always going to be cultural differences in how human rights are, are defined. In the West, it's always a ballot box and freedom of speech. In the East, it's about jobs, uh, living longer, uh, economic prosperity, access to a brighter future. Uh, but this is, as I said, not something that can be handled uh, by mm. a press release or railing against uh, you know, the governments or any kind of disinformation campaign. It's simply going to be, take a long slog of continuous achievements, uh, which I believe China is capable of doing. But, but Victor, there are real and, and painful consequences for many people involved in this. For example, international companies have to force to pick size. The cotton industry has been impacted greatly. Uh, in a recent interview, although the chief representative of the China Office of Better Cotton Initiative said they didn't find any evidence of forced labor, probably BCI will double down uh, on their sanctions. So what is the long-term consequences for cotton garment industries and how can they deal with the shock? Thank you very much. This, uh, this is a very important question. Let me uh, uh, share with you some of my uh, big picture impressions. First of all, the Uyghur people and their ancestors have been part of the Chinese family for about 2,000 years. And I can assure you that the Uyghur brothers and sisters will remain part of the Chinese family for another 2,000 years and longer. Mm -hmm. So there is no doubt at all that Xinjiang will remain part of the Chinese territory and the Uyghur brothers and sisters will be very proud members of the Chinese nation as a whole. Anyone who believes that they have a scheme to split Xinjiang away from China or to tear the Uyghurs away from the Chinese nation as a whole will end miserably failing. That's the bigger trend. Now, secondly, China may need to stand up and call for an immediate end to the war in Afghanistan. After all, the war in Afghanistan has lasted for 20 years. It has caused uh, hundreds of thousands of loss of innocent lives, destruction of property everywhere, plunging the whole country into mm. extreme disaster and a fuel, for, uh, fueling the radicalization of the uh, people in Afghanistan, causing tremendous amount of spillover into Pakistan and into Xinjiang, which borders with Afghanistan and other countries and regions in this part of the world. I think all countries need to rise up and call on the United States and NATO members mm -hmm. to put an immediate end to the war in Afghanistan and expose the true nature of the spillover of radicalization from Afghanistan into Xinjiang, which is actually one of the main reasons for the uh, instability in Xinjiang and causing tremendous amount of pressure on China as a whole and on the Chinese government as a whole. So I think I'm very confident that in the medium and longer term, the rest of the world, including European countries and including even the United States, will come to the conclusion that the mega trend will stand and China will prevail as far as its policies regarding Xinjiang is concerned. Why? Because the people in Xinjiang, of all nationalities, including the Uyghur brothers and sisters, are proud and are happy about better safety, higher quality of living, and being proud members of the Chinese nation as a whole. Right. This is the mega trend for Xinjiang. All right. On that mega trend, we have to wrap up. Thank you very much, Victor, Helga, Sultan, and Einar. And you've been watching Thank Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zhou in Beijing. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.